Hi everyone, welcome to Peoples Online. Our goal is to encourage and inspire you on your walk with God. Come and join us on Sunday mornings at 9.30 and 11.15. Stay tuned for the whole video and we'll be able to give you ways to connect with us. Enjoy today's message. Well, let's get into God's Word. Today we're continuing with our series on the Beatitudes. And today we're talking about hunger and thirst. Hunger and thirst. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, it says, Blessed, joyful, nourished by God's goodness are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who actively seek right standing with God, for they will be completely satisfied. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you today. Thank you today for your church, for your people. Thank you for times of worship. Thank you for communion today. And now, Father, we just pray that you would just speak to us through your word, that you would challenge us, that you would uh, illuminate your word so that, God, we will leave this place changed. We ask it in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. How many of you have ever woken up in the morning with a dry mouth? Anybody here ever wake up in the morning with a dry mouth? Someone tries to talk to you, and you're like, ah, ah. You got to get a drink first. You got to you got to wake up your voice. I've been thirsty at times. I have morning voice. I have it every morning. The first person that talks to me thinks that I am, have like the plague or I'm you know like on the verge of death. If you call me first, if you're the first person I talk to, I'll be like, I'll be like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm just have my morning voice. Today we're going to talk about hunger and thirst. And I was thinking about when I put my kids to bed. How many of you, when uh, you remember, maybe you have small kids now, or you remember when you had small kids, how much of a chore it was to put your kids to bed sometimes? And how they would play these games. Like, you'd say, all right, go up to bed. And then they'd say, but, I, but I'm hungry. And then you're like, well, I don't want to send them to bed hungry. And so you make them food, or you make them something to eat, and then they go up to the, oh, I'm thirsty. And then they, oh, What's next? Oh, I need this. Oh, I forgot my homework. All these kind of things ha happen. I was reading this funny story. If you grew up in a big family, you probably experienced something like this, but here's the story. My brother and I always made excuses to try out and stay up late. This joke has to be the cheesiest ever. I said, Mom and Dad, I, Mom and Dad, can I have a drink of water? And the mother replied, No. We have to get up early tomorrow morning. Now go to bed. All right. Then 10 minutes later, Mom, Dad, can I have a drink of water? And the mother replies, No. Go to bed. I said, No. Then another 10 minutes later, Mom, Dad, can I have a drink of water, please? No. Now go to bed. Then 10 minutes later, finally Dad gets involved. Mom, Dad, can I have a drink of water? The father replies, no. Now you go to bed or I will come up there and I will spank your butt. How many got spankings when you were young? Let me see your hands. Why can't we spank anymore? The father said, go to bed or I'll come up there and I'll spank your butt. To which the boy replied, Mom, Dad, when you come to spank my butt, can you bring me a glass of water? <laughs> if you're thirsty, you're thirsty. I remember watching certain nature survival shows. I don't know if you have a PVR, but I have a PVR and I record all my favorite shows just in case I'm not home to watch them. Some of my favorite ones are nature survival shows. There's this one called Man and Woman Wild, and it's a husband and wife, and they just go into various nature experiences. And it's purely entertainment for me, because you're never going to find me walking into the wilderness with a tube and a match, and that's it for a week. So these guys go and they try to survive off of whatever's around. And I remember watching this one. They've been in the wilderness for whatever, for however long, a few days. And, and all of a sudden, 
you know, they're thirsty and they're trying to figure out water and, and the husband goes, well, if we need to, we can drink pee. And I was like, exactly why I'll, I will never do this. I will never be found in the place where I have to do that. <laughs> I remember another one, I'm watching it, and the guy is like so thirsty, he, he's searching everywhere, he comes across this little puddle, and it's full of bugs and green stuff, and he starts trying to strain it out, and then finally it's taking too long, and he just gets down and he just starts drinking it like a dog. I'm like, again, this is purely entertainment for me. Because I will never put those things, those skills into practice in my life. I will stay close to the faucet. <laughs> I will stay close to the refrigerator. Amen? But I think it's interesting. Now, when we read this, uh, this short little passage of the Beatitudes, we've got to understand the audience. Our lens and the lens of the original hearers would be completely different. Because my lens, if you say I'm hungry or I'm thirsty, to me, that means, oh, you didn't eat breakfast. You were too busy. I'm hungry. Or, or I, you know, I, I forgot to eat lunch. So if you say I'm thirsty, I'm thinking, oh, you must have been outside mowing your lawn and you stayed in the sun too long and you're thirsty. I'm not thinking of, general starvation or dying of thirst. I'm thinking of, yeah, you just need a drink. Or, and so what do I do? I, hey, if I'm hungry, I'll walk to the refrigerator or I'll get in my car and go to the drive-thru, right? That's, those are easy things to solve. But when we look at this audience, they come from a totally different perspective. And Jesus is talking to them and he says, blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And the hunger and thirst that he's talking about is not, not a hunger like, oh, I just want to get a little snack to tide me over for dinner. The hunger he's talking about is literally starvation. These people grew up in a time where a working man's wage was one denarii. One. And that was supposed to take care of his family. The, the listeners would have, been, would have grown up in a time, in an ancient time, where they lived on the border of real starvation. Not only that, but they, it, Palestine was a desert region. It still is a desert region. There are rainy seasons, but it's a desert. They would have known what it was like to go on journeys or to walk and, and maybe be caught in a sandstorm or something like that. And even back then, when they would travel, they would, they would know. They would be, they, they would, it's marked all over the map where the wells were. They never wanted to be caught out of the range of water. Why? Because you don't want to have to drink some bad stuff. You don't want to have to you don't want to find yourself. We lived in San Diego. Interesting enough, San Diego is a desert, and it's on the ocean. But there were constantly news reports of people that didn't respect the desert. And they would wander in, oh, let's go for a hike, and they would be caught in this desert. And they, 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 they didn't realize how hot the sun was, how dry it was, and they found themselves in a predicament. And the ancient people that Jesus was talking to, that was the reality. They knew what it was like. And so Jesus, when he said, blessed are you who hunger and thirst, their lens was different than our lens. Way different. And Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. The hunger of someone who is starving for food, the thirst of someone who will die unless something is given to them to drink. The reason I point that out is because there's an intensity that surrounds this little part of the scripture. Jesus wasn't saying that our desire is supposed to be like, oh, I'd like a little snack of righteousness. Could I get a little spot of tea of righteousness? But Jesus was saying, blessed are those who have an intense desire, a passion for righteousness. What is right, righteousness? 
It's rightness with God, right relationship with God. To act justly. To have personal, personal relationship, unhindered, right relationship with God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for a right relationship, who crave and desire a right relationship. And what does it say? For they will be filled. Everybody say filled. Filled. That's a great word. He promises that we will be filled. Matthew 5, 6. I'm going to read it again. Blessed, joyful, nourished by God's goodness are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who actively, say actively. Those who actively seek right standing with God. For they will be completely satisfied. You know, we actively search, humanity does. Because we're all created with this desire and this longing inside of us. The problem is, we search in a lot of different places. I don't know what your BC was like, your before Christ. But many of us would have a testimony that we bought into some of the things that the world tries to sell us that would say, if you do this, you will feel complete. If you throw your life into this, you're going to feel satisfied. But you know what I've come to realize? is that rich people have problems too. Did you ever know? Do you know that? And once you get everything that you've worked so hard for, there's still an unsatisfied desire in your heart. There's still an unsatisfied... And, and, and one of my favorite verses, when I was a youth, when I gave my life to God, like when I was a kid, I grew up in church. And I was at church all the time. But at, up to a certain point, my faith was actually my parents' faith. That's why it's so important to, for parents to model right faith because I was basically living off the faith of my parents. They modeled it. They showed it. I followed them. But it wasn't until I was a teenager that it became deeply personal to me. I had a, began a personal relationship with Jesus. A personal relationship. And one of the verses that started to make sense to me was found in Ecclesiastes 3.11. Here's what it says. It says, God has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into the hearts and the mind of men. Yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. When I gave my life to Jesus and I began to seek him, Something amazing happened in my life. Because I remember, I can remember my first in real encounters with God. Like I, I remember going to church, being at the altar. I remember feeling guilty for my sins. But I remember the most significant moments, and I've said this before, were the moments that I spent alone with God in my, in my bedroom. And I had this little old keyboard. I, I always talk about it. And I spent time trying to learn how to play a couple worship songs that I stole off the music stand from the worship team at church. And I took them home, and I started to play them. And as I began to spend time, invest time in trying to play and to worship God, God met me in that place. And up to that point, listen, I was, you know what, I was good at finding trouble. And trouble was good at finding me. I was a handful for my parents. I was always getting in fights. I was always having parent-teacher interviews. I was always getting sent home. I don't know, I... What God has done such a miraculous work in my life? <laughs> but for the grace of God. 
I'm telling you, I, I, and, you know, put all the pressures of being a teenager and everything that teenagers live for and are, are starting to get exposed to and, and the partying and the drinking and all that kind of stuff. When I was about 15 or 16, it happened. You know, I had all those pressures around me, but what saved me was I found God in that secret place, in that, in that space. And when I truly met God, I was satisfied. I wasn't looking around. I wasn't, like, I didn't envy my friends. I mean, sometimes they had social stuff going on. I was like, I wish I could be there. But it wasn't worth it to me. It, the trade wasn't worth it. And, it, what, and listen, I wasn't a perfect person after, I, you know, I was just, I was doing my best to follow God. And God satisfied me. But it, it was only after I started the process of seeking God that my desire increased. And that's what happens in our lives. If you want to have more of a desire for God, for the things of God, you have to do things that are going to awaken that desire or that appetite. Sometimes we find ourselves in a place where we're like, oh, I don't feel like it, or, or, or you know, God is so far away from me. And listen, I, you know, I just remember in, in the book of Revelations, in the church of Ephesus, where, where, where the thing that was held against the churches was that they, forso- they, they had forsaken the thing that they had done at first. Do you remember... Do you remember when you first met Jesus, when you first encountered Christ, the, the joy that flooded your life, the peace and contentment? Now, what happens as we go on, sometimes the enemy is really good at tricking us into buying into and drinking from other sources. When we can be drinking from the faucet, from the, from the living water, we choose to drink from the puddle. And we expect the same amount of satisfaction the enemy tricks us and we buy into it no amount of money will ever satisfy you no status no job promotion no relationship nothing you were created by God for God you were created for his presence Ecclesiastes 3.11 says he has put eternity, this longing and this desire inside of you and it can only be filled by God And that's what we experience as Christians. We get the satisfaction, this contentment that's found in Jesus. He's put that in our hearts. Listen, when the world invests their time and they strive for those scenic vacations, my brother-in-law and my sister are here today. My older sister, she used to beat me up when I was young. God forgive her. (laughs) They came from Alberta to enjoy the scenic vacation of Hamilton. (laughs) When the world strives for these things, you know, they put their hope in, in, in... in creativity and accomplishments and, and, and even sexual exploits and, and, and they throw everything, their lives into these things and, and, and those things satisfy for but a time. Vacation satisfy for but a time. Then you gotta go back to work. Everything in this world will fade. The only thing that stands is God and his word. And you were created not for this world. I think it was C.S. Lewis that said this. He said, if you have a desire in your heart that can't be filled by anything in this world, then clearly you were created for a different world. We were created for God, for heaven, for the presence of God. So, here we are. These things fade. I'm reminded of the book of John, chapter 4, when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. He met her at a well outside of the town. And as the story goes, Jesus begins to speak to her. 
And she had been married five times and, the, and was living with a man who wasn't her husband now. And yet Jesus, and this is what I love about Jesus. You know, we're good. We, we, we like to pick out our own faults. We like to also pick out the faults in other people as well. We focus on those. But here Jesus is. Jesus doesn't give her a lecture on her, on her morality or anything like that. But Jesus talks to her. And he begins to speak to her about the thirst, the deep thirst inside of her. The truth is she was going from relationship, from thing to thing, trying to fulfill the desire in her heart. And we do the same thing. But Jesus talked to her about thirst. And this is what he said in verse 14. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. But the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water, satisfying his thirst for God, welling up, continually flowing, bubbling within him to eternal life. When you drink, listen, when you drink from the wrong source, you'll never be satisfied. But when you drink from the living water, the living water from Jesus, he will satisfy the deepest longing in your soul. Aren't you thankful for that today? Aren't you thankful that he has satisfied you? That you don't, you know, sometimes we forget, but you don't have to chase the things of this world. You don't have to try to, to make a way for yourself. But Jesus has satisfied you. I'm thankful today. I'm going to give you three keys to stimulate your hunger, to make sure that your hunger and thirst are stimulated towards righteousness. And the first thing we need to do is make sure that. We are drinking from the right source. So you need to check your source. If, someone, if you were talking to somebody and you made a statement, they said, whoa, 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 you need to check your source. That would be negative, right? You need to check your source. You know what? We need to check and make sure in our lives that we are not building our lives on things Things that this world is, says is great and important, we're not striving for those things, and we're, and we're neglecting the true source, Jesus. That's a challenge to us. That's a challenge of this scripture. There is nothing else that satisfies like Jesus. Everything else fades. And you need to ask yourself, and I need to ask myself, are there times in my life when I replace the living water with the pursuit of the things of this world. Listen, I'm not saying that you can't do things that you like and have things that you like, but they can't be your source of hope in life. It all has to start in Jesus. And when we take away from Jesus and we put it in these other things, ultimately, we're going to start looking at our lives and say, why, why am I not content? Why am I always jumping from job to job? Why am I always jumping from relationship to relationship? Why is everything okay, but I feel horrible? Why is there nothing wrong, but I don't feel like everything's, anything's right? Your source, first and foremost, has to be who? Jesus. Who? Jesus. Jesus. So check your source. The second thing is this. Don't take a little, take it all. Don't just take a little, take it all. You know, one of the interesting things about this beatitude is when you take it back to the original language, the original Greek, you catch something that you miss if you just read it just like from the NIV version. And the best way I can explain it is this. Without all the complexity, the best way I can explain it is if I showed up at your door today. I'm coming to your house. And I knock on your door. And I say, I'm hungry for some bread. And you say, okay. Well, come in then. And I come in and you give me a piece of bread. And then I say, I'm, I'm thirsty though. I'm thirsty for some water. And, and, and you get a cup of water or a cup of juice and you take it and you give me the cup. 
The best way I can explain it is in this passage, it's not talking about getting a piece of something. It's not blessed are those who hunger and thirst for a piece of righteousness. What it's saying is this. I come to your house, I knock on your door, and I say, I'm hungry for bread. And you say, come in, I'll get you a piece of toast. And you put a piece of toast down, and I go, no, I want the whole loaf. Not just a part of it. And then I'm like, I, I, you know what, can I have a glass of your juice? Or no, can I have some of your juice? And you bring me a glass, and I go, no, 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 no. I want the whole pitcher. In its original, in its original, there's no separation. It's all of it. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for all of the righteousness of God, for they will be filled. Sometimes we take parts that we like. We partially surrender our lives. The areas that are convenient and easy. How many of you know that it's not, well, I'm just saying for me, it hasn't always been easy to follow Christ wholeheartedly. There have been a lot of, there's been a lot of sacrifice. There's been a lot of times I've had to deny myself. There's been a lot of times that I've failed. See, what we have a problem with in our culture is we think it's like a buffet mentality. Now, you know I like buffets, okay? So you can go and you can just take what you like. I don't like that. I like that, though. I'm going to fill my plate up with that. But I don't want that. But that's good for you. I don't care if it's good for me. I don't want it. Yeah, but you should. It's healthy. No, no, no. I just want this. We approach the righteousness and the things of God like we, it's, we're consumers. It's a consumer-based society. Listen, Jesus was talking to his disciples. You are his disciples. I am his disciples. Jesus wants you to wholeheartedly, that space that inside of you that was created for him, he wants to fill the whole space, not just part. He's not into just giving you a slice of bread. He wants to give you all of it. But you can't hold on. You can't hold on to these ears. Sometimes the reason we don't sacrifice is we're afraid that we'll be left with nothing. And I just want to challenge you. That's broken thinking. That's broken Because when you give everything to God, that's when you truly realize you have everything. And listen, sometimes we're like, well, what if I never get it back? You have God. You have everything. Sometimes it's a test, too. God's wondering, hey, is that that an idol? Is Is that thing more important than me? Maybe you need to lay it down. I've known people to do that. They finally get to the place they lay it down. And then I've seen those things and those dreams resurrected like never before. Because now it was God was the center and not this talent or this ability or this dream. God was the center of it. Here's what Romans 12, 1 and 2 says. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourself set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. And don't be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes, so that you may prove for yourself what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in His plan and purpose for you. Don't just take a little, take it all. Don't just give a little, give it all. You were created for him. The last thing is this, if you want to develop a desire, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, for righteousness, you have to work up your appetite. 
Now, not many people know this about me, but when I was around five years old, I stopped eating meat because I thought it was cruel to animals to eat meat. And so I would not eat meat. I wouldn't eat cheese. I wouldn't drink milk. Even today, I won't drink milk. I don't like milk. I use almond milk, which tastes horrible. <laughs> but my parents, you know, as frustrating as it was, I, I ate a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, all right? And I survived. Look at me, I'm thriving. But I stopped eating meat, everything all together. Once in a while, they tried to force me to eat chicken or fish or something like that. Wouldn't have it. Didn't want it. Not even bacon. Are you kidding me? Bacon is like food from heaven. I don't know what. But here I am. What happened was interesting. When I became a teenager, I was a Vancouver Canucks fan. And my youth group would get together and watch the Vancouver Canucks. And... and uh, They all knew that I didn't eat meat. And one year, the Vancouver Canucks were doing extremely well. uh, And then they lost. (laughs) And so the next year, I was, you know, a diehard fan. You know the West Coast fans are crazy. They riot and they do crazy things out there when things don't go their way. And so here I am. The next year, I think it might have been 95 or something like that, I was uh, in my youth group. And my youth leader's name was Stan Siebert. And he... He made a wager with me. I made a bet. Youth leaders shouldn't bet with your students, just so you know. But he made a bet with me. He was like, because I was a diehard fan, I was like, Canucks are going all the way this year. They're going all the way. And he's like, no, they're not. I'm like, yes, they are. And he goes, well, let's make a bet then if you're so sure. And I'm like, let's do it. He goes, if, if, if the Vancouver Canucks go all the way, he said, I will eat a whole raw beef liver. I was like, all right. He goes, but if the Canucks don't go all the way, you have to eat a 40-ounce steak that I cook. And I was like, hmm. Challenge accepted. (laughs) I had a lot of faith in the Vancouver Canucks. You know, when we put faith in our Canadian team, that's never good. (laughs) Never. Because that year, the Vancouver Canucks didn't even make the playoffs, I don't think. And here I was at a youth event. They cooked this big, huge steak. And they put it in front of me. It was massive. And I had to eat it. Something happened in my life that day. (laughs) I mean, I got really sick because I hadn't eaten meat in a long time. But man... I didn't realize what I was missing. That tasted so good. And I've never been the same, ever. <laughs> Something changed in my life. Serious. And after that, what was interesting is I started literally like craving meat. I was like, and, you know, I, and, Today I'm having hamburgers. <laughs> like I'm, I'm getting ready. After this is over, we're going home and having a barbecue. But I, I now I eat meat, and something changed. It doesn't matter how many times I watched Charlotte's Web and felt guilty. Now I had this craving for meat. It changed in me. You know what? What you take in affects you. Physically and spiritually. And sometimes we are so consumed with the junk of this life that we don't have time for the good food of the presence of God, of His Word, of of being in worship. And all those things are are, are, are what stimulate a desire in you, a craving for the righteousness of God. The longer you stay out of God's presence, the less desire you have for it. But when you spend time in God's Word, when you spend time in worship, something happens in your life. Something begins to shift in your life. And I've talked to people many times 
Many times, and they would say, I don't feel close to God. And you know what? What I've learned in my life is this, that I will never feel my way into right actions. But if I do what's right, eventually my feelings will catch up with what I'm doing. So in faith, if you purpose in your heart and decide, I'm going to spend time, I'm going to invest in my relationship with Jesus, eventually your feelings will catch up with your actions that are done in faith. If you feel distant from God, guess what? He's, a, he's not a phone call away. He's as close as mentioning his name. He's as close as setting aside time and saying, God, I want you to speak to me. And in the beginning, I know it's intimidating. Some some people open the word of God and they're like, Aaron begat who, who begat who? And you're like, what does this all mean? But listen, I'll tell, I'll tell you what I do. When I open the word of God, the first thing I do is I pray and I say, Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would just illuminate your word to me. Illuminate it. Holy Spirit, breathe and show me, teach me. Now, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I invest that time and I don't know what I read. And I don't know what I got from it. At that moment. But there have been times where just when I needed a revelation from God, it was brought back to my memory what I had read previously. Whenever you sow in spiritual things, it will reap a harvest. God never denies his word he's not a man that he should lie he's faithful but listen we need to set aside time what's your routine like what's your monday through friday i know what your sunday's like it's like mine we're at church but what about monday through friday do you set aside time for god Will you set aside time for God? He wants you to hunger and thirst, not for a little snack, but he wants an intense desire in you. You're supposed to have an intense desire for God. And God in turn promises, what does he promise? He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they, what, what is the blessing? The blessing is, that you receive and you are filled. You are filled. Amen? The last and final thought is this. The scripture reads, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And today I want you to know that blessing comes to all. Sometimes we think we're disqualified. Maybe we fail or we've made mistakes. But this scripture shows us that blessing is not contingent upon your ability, your works, your perfection. What's amazing about this scripture is it shows us that we can begin again, even if we've got off track. Because it doesn't say blessed are those who are perfect and do everything right and hunger and thirst. It's simp- the prerequisite is simply hunger and thirst. So can you stir up a hunger in your life, a thirst? It doesn't matter how bad you've been. It doesn't matter how, how far you've wandered. The blessing is this, that in spite of failures and feelings, you can experience the fullness of God. You might not have everything worked out. You might have some bad habits, but guess what? Guess what? All you need to do is hunger and thirst and and pursue the rightness, the right relationship with God. And guess what happens? God begins to fill you as long as you're honest, as long as you're real. He begins to fill you and fill you and fill you until there's no room for anything else. Listen, if you, got, if you got issues, welcome to the club. We all got them. There's no one better here than another. Just some of us have been doing it a little bit longer. We've learned things, and we should be willing to help one another. No one's ever going to judge you. But you have an opportunity 
to every single person to the fullness of God. And listen, that's the point of it all anyway. Jesus, God wants you to experience the fullness of God. He want, that, that's why he said, bless, he wants you to, to experience the blessing. He wants you to have it all. Not just a sliver, not just a cup, but he said, drink from the living water. It becomes like a continuous spring. And water changes things. If you've ever seen a, 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 a landslide or a water or a flood, water can shift the landscape and change it all. And that's what the living water of God does in your life. So when you get into the water, when you allow him to fill you, that living water begins to shift and change things inside of you. Amen? So listen. Get into it. Take some time. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. I pray, I pray that it would continue to speak to us and challenge us and draw us. God, we honor you today. And Father, I just thank you for, for this church family. Father, I pray if anybody be struggling with difficulties, that Father, you would, uh, that, Father, you would just let them know you're with them that they're not forgotten, that you care about them. So today, strengthen your people. Give them hope. You are our hope. And Father, fill them with righteousness. Awaken our desire in you, we pray. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Let's stand to our feet. We are done. But first, I want you to turn to your neighbor and give them a high five and say, you are the coolest person I've ever met in my life. I hope you enjoyed today's video. We would love to hear your story and what God is doing in your life. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email us, info at the pc.ca. We have something for everyone and everyone is welcome. Visit our website, thepc.ca, or like us on Facebook. Have a good day.